Hi, today we're going to talk about principles of stable isotope analysis. Now these really are just principles and so we will be talking about applications of these principles in the marine environment in subsequent lectures. But for now, what I want you to really get a handle on is why we apply these principles, why they happen, so that you can understand if you ever come across a novel process, uh, whether or not fractionation would be an issue in that process. So we talked about this briefly in class on Tuesday. First of all, that there are differences between isotopes of the same element, but that difference is really more about mass than about size. So different isotopes of the same element have the same, more or less, atomic radius, but noticeably different masses. But what does that mean to say that something has a higher mass? What effect does that have? Would that mass difference affect the physical properties, not just of the atom, but of any substance of which that atom is a part. So for example, we'll talk a lot about oxygen isotopes. What is the difference between a CO2 molecule that's made up of the normal isotopes of carbon and oxygen, carbon 12 and oxygen 16, versus one that has a heavier isotope of carbon or of oxygen? Right? What if one of those oxygens was an oxygen 18 instead of an oxygen 16? What if that carbon was not a carbon 12, but a carbon 13 or a carbon 14? So we need to understand how the physical properties of that substance change as those masses change. And does it not just change the physical properties, does it also change the chemical properties of the substance? So let's start out with the physical properties, and the easiest way to understand changes in physical properties is to talk about temperature. And if you think back to Gen Chem, you'll remember that temperature is a measure of your average kinetic energy of the molecules of the substance. Okay, it is an average, which means whatever that average is, you're going to have some that are moving slower, some a little slower, some very much slower, right? Uh, and then some that are moving faster, some a little faster, and some quite a bit faster. But the numbers um, are going to be really clustered around that, that average kinetic energy. And so most of your molecules, the highest probabilities, are going to be the kinetic energies really close to the average. So we can talk about kinetic energy in a very mathematical sense by using the equation the kinetic energy is one-half mv squared, one-half the mass times velocity squared. Okay, now what does that mean in terms of molecular movement of isotopes? So let's say that we're looking at a gas and we're going to look at helium gas and I'm saying gas because that's the easiest way to look at molecular motion. Gases are moving faster than you know solid or liquid particles. So we're going to look at helium because it is a nice monoatomic gas and is therefore easy to model. So let's look at these two stable isotopes of helium, helium-3 and helium-4. Okay, one of those has a different mass than the other. Now if you have a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4 gases and they're all at the same temperature, what does that mean in terms of energy? Well even though they're different isotopes, because they're at the same temperature they're going to have the same average kinetic energy. So let's look at the equation for kinetic energy again and let's rewrite it, let's rearrange it. And the way I've rearranged it is like this. So velocity equals the square root of two times the kinetic energy over the mass. Now what does that equation mean for our helium-3 and our helium-4? 
for both isotopes in our gas mixture, they're at the same temperature, the kinetic energy is the same. So that part is not going to change. But their mass is different. So in one of these, it's going to be the square root of 2e over, let's just say 3 for the mass. Ignore all the decimals that go after that. And for the other, it'll be the square root of 2e over 4. Okay, so we're dividing by 3 or dividing by 4. And basically, the larger your mass is, the smaller that fraction is going to be, and the lower your velocity is going to be. The heavier an isotope is, the slower it's going to move at any given temperature. And that's true whether it's a single atom, like in the helium gas that we were talking about, or whether that is part of a larger molecule. So a larger molecule with carbon-12 is going to move faster than a, the same large molecule with a carbon-13 or carbon-14 at a given temperature. Because of this principle that heavier masses are going to move slower at a given temperature, we can confidently state that there are two physical properties that are going to change with mass. The first one makes a lot of sense and is the first thing that people come up with if I ask them to just brainstorm, and that is the boiling point. Right? Why does this make sense? It's because in order for a liquid to boil, you basically have to increase the temperature to the point where many, many molecules are moving fast enough to break the intermolecular forces holding that liquid together, and so they go flying off. So basically you need a lot of high velocity molecules in order for something to boil. Because things move more slowly when the mass is higher, if you have a liquid that has two different isotopes in it, one of which is lighter and one of which is heavier, the lighter one is going to boil, evaporate away faster than the heavier isotope. Of course, in the natural world, it's very rare that you actually have stuff boiling off, right? It's, it's rare that we're operating at that sort of temperature, at least not here on Earth. What we worry about more is this other physical property, which is vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is a measure of what fraction of the molecules in a liquid are going to turn into gas as the liquid just sits there at a given temperature. Usually we think about it at whatever the ambient air temperature is. And that's the property that we worry more about in the natural world. Because of course, when we think about things like the water cycle, there is a lot of vaporization going on. Not necessarily boiling, but liquids turning into gases. So we think about how we have these large bodies of water like the ocean, and water is evaporating from that. That is a process that is going to depend on the mass of the isotopes in the water. And we're going to talk about that more later in this video. Now here's the part that people understand a little bit less which is that velocity differences, because of mass differences, can also affect chemical reactivity. Now, this frequently happens to a lesser extent than we see in physical processes like vaporization, but it does happen, and the reason that it happens is because of what we call collision theory of reactions, which is basically that if you want a reaction to occur, the molecules involved have to collide, but they can't just collide any old way. They have to collide first with sufficient energy and second at the right angle. And the reason that has to happen is because that collision provides the energy to break the bonds that are holding the old molecules together so that the new bonds can form. Now, if you think about it, we just said that heavier isotopes are traveling more slowly than the lighter isotopes. Because of that, there is a possibility 
And this is less of a possibility that it was when you're talking about vaporization or whatever, um, where because they're traveling more slowly, they may not collide with enough speed to react. And the reason I say that might be a problem is because they still have the same kinetic energy. And so it's not quite the same, but there definitely are reactions where that slower speed is going to cause a lower reaction rate. So that is the one place where we worry about possibly the, the chemical reactivity being affected by isotopes. In a lot of biological processes, these things tend to be mediated by enzymes. And so we don't always see plants preferentially taking up one isotope over another. Some do. But let's think about this in terms of biological processes. We have a plant, which is what I have in this picture, or something like a diatom or cyanobacteria taking in CO2. Well, CO2, right, is carbon, could have different isotopes, and oxygen, which we know has different isotopes, is taking in water, and we know hydrogen has different isotopes, oxygen has different isotopes, right? And it's putting out oxygen, which of course has its own isotopes. And it's producing carbohydrates, right, of different sorts. So if there's not much of a change in chemical reactivity, and there might or might not be, depending on which organism you're talking about, would plants show different isotope ratios than the world around it? And the answer is possibly, right? So a plant has taken water. Well, where does that water come from? It comes from rain. There can be physical processes that affect the isotopes in rain. So a plant may be getting a different isotope ratio of water than is found in the lake that's upwind from the plant. And so that sort of process is what we look at when we look at stable isotope analysis, because understanding how the isotopes change due to the interplay of the physical and chemical processes helps us to understand the origins of the ingredients that go into this. All right, so let's look at a, a slightly more quantitative look at what we call fractionation. And we're going to look at evaporation, which, as I said, is a process where we definitely see the differences between heavier and lighter isotopes. So if we think about a large body of water like the ocean, we think about evaporation. Um, we could just say, oh, there's water there. But let's not just think of it as one big body of water. Let's think of it as a bunch of water molecules of which some have oxygen 16 and some have oxygen 18. So we can break down total evaporation into two different processes, evaporation of water molecules that have oxygen 16 and evaporation of water molecules that have oxygen 18. So let's say we had a magical molecule counter and before the water evaporated, we found that for every 100,000 molecules of water with oxygen 16 we had, there are 200 molecules of water with oxygen 18. But then imagine that we also had our magical molecule counter up in the clouds above the ocean, and we could count the molecules that made it up after evaporation. We would see that, for example, for every 100,000 molecules of water with oxygen 16 in it, we might only have 198. Now, as you can see, it's a slightly different ratio. It's a very small difference, and most of these are actually fairly small differences um, because there's a mass difference. It's not that much of a mass difference, right? It's you know maybe a 10% mass difference. So 
we need some way to calculate these really tiny changes that happen over time. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what we call a del value for a given process. So here's an equation, and I'm going to walk you through this equation. So first of all, we have this symbol over here that might look familiar to those of you who have taken calculus. It's a delta, but we abbreviate it. We call it del. And I put an x after it, but usually what's going to go in that spot where the x is is whatever isotope you're analyzing. Okay, so this del value is a measure of what we call fractionation that evaluates how a physical process changes the isotope ratios. Here R stands for a ratio. And it's a ratio of whatever isotope you're measuring, isotope X, to whatever the most common isotope is for that element. Now, what you have to understand is that we never calculate del values for the most common isotope. So if we're calculating del values for carbon, we don't measure del for carbon 12, which is the most common element. We measure it for carbon 13, we measure it for carbon 14, but not for carbon 12. So we have three R values here. Well, two of them are the same. We have the R of the sample, the ratio of the sample, and that's what you want to find out about. And then we have the ratio for a reference. And you can say, well, what is the reference? The reference is whatever is representing what happened before the process you're measuring. So I'm going to show you a very simple calculation, but usually what we plug in for those reference R's is going to come from global standards. Okay, so when we talk about water, we'll talk about the, the SMO, the standard mean ocean water. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of different global standards that you can look up. Okay, so let's go back to this example that I gave earlier, where we have evaporation of water with oxygen 16 versus evaporation of water with oxygen 18. And we're going to calculate using the equation that I just gave you. And let's start out by talking about what the ratios, etc., are for this particular example. So First of all, you'll see that instead of saying del x, I actually put del 18O. So we're specifically measuring the del value of oxygen 18. And then if you look at the ratios, I've written them literally as a ratio, a fraction of what? The isotope we're measuring, oxygen 18, divided by the most common isotope of that element, which is oxygen 16. So oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. Oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratio for the sample, which in this case is going to be our evaporated water, and then minus oxygen 18 divided by oxygen 16 for our reference, which is the stuff before the process. It's the stuff in the ocean. So oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 of our sample which is the water after evaporation, so 198 for oxygen 18, 196 for oxygen 16, and then now let's look at our reference, which is what it was before the evaporation, and there we have 100,000 before for the oxygen 16 and 200 for the oxygen 18. So we'll plug those numbers in to our calculator. If we calculate out the ratios, we get these decimals multiplied by a thousand because we always get really tiny numbers. So what does that del value tell us? First of all, remember it's del 18 oxygen. So 
what this is telling us is about the fractionation behavior of oxygen 18. It's telling how oxygen 18 behavior changes relative to oxygen 16. You'll notice this value is negative. What does that mean? The percentage of molecules with oxygen 18 that undergo evaporation will be smaller than the percentage of oxygen 16 molecules that undergo. Uh, now at the end we have this little symbol which is pronounced per mil. Originally it was per mil, so French or Latin or whatever, um, which is thousand, so per thousand. This is what some people would call a part per thousand. So we definitely did part per thousand measurements when we were uh, doing salinity. It was the same sort of thing. Per thousand molecules, how many will this change by, right? So in this particular case, what it means that per thousand molecules of oxygen 18, you'll get 10 fewer than you would expect if there were molecules of oxygen 16. So that gives you an idea of why different isotopes would undergo different rates of physical and possibly chemical processes. And it also explains how we can track these processes. What I want you to think about is possibly thinking about different processes where this might be important in regards to ocean biology or chemistry and scribble a few of those down be prepared to talk about that and any other questions you have as to things you don't understand in this video and that's what we're going to be talking about on thursday